I'm going to say so much dumb stuff. I'm embarrassed to be on film today. Ready? Yeah. Okay. No pressure. All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Monroe Live. I'll be your host today along with Walker Lee. Uh, my name is Jordan Rocha. I'm the director of commercial here at Monroe and Associates. And today we're going to be looking at, and mostly Walker, we're going to be looking at a Nissan Aria. So we just got this vehicle in as a press vehicle not too long ago. And so we'll take you through kind of first impressions, things that we saw, things that we liked and disliked, uh, both in terms of sort of the consumer facing items, things that we're seeing from the outside looking in, exterior, interior, creature comfort, that sort of thing. But then also we'll pop the hood and we'll look at some more technically oriented things. Again, like with, the, you know, hopefully with the Monroe live videos, you guys are getting a sense that we don't just do the, the vehicle reviews, but we really try and dig into the technical side of things. You know, try and ascertain looking at the components, why a given OEM executed a certain way, used a certain material, um, and, and did different things technically, especially as we open the hood, we may talk to some of those things. So. Walker, I know you had this vehicle for several days over the weekend, right? I'm sure you were bebopping all over town with it. I don't blame you. So based on that ride, what are, what are some things at a high level that you really liked and disliked about this vehicle? And if you could talk to those. Sure. I guess starting with the likes, um, it being an EV, you get a lot of benefits like the, the smooth ride that it did have as well as the, the quiet cabin. It was extremely smooth, extremely quiet. Um, I've driven, I say, a handful of EVs over the past week, uh, unfortunately, and fortunately, I guess, uh, given that my car was out of commission. So I got to have a lot of exposure to different ranges of OEMs um, and their different electric vehicle offerings. And yeah, overall, I would say I was impressed with the, the ride and drive of this vehicle. Um, it did have some downsides in terms of the price that you were having to pay to get some of those um, those features and that content. But, but overall, I'd say it was a, a pretty smooth ride. Yeah, and there's definitely like Walker, as you and I were talking about before the video here, right? There's some technical enablers to getting this vehicle quiet and kind of getting that sensation that you were describing, right? From from the cabin or from the driver's perspective. A lot of those live under hood, you know, but even things, you know, at this price point, like the laminated glass, meaning we've got two panes of glass and then a laminate in between on both front and rear glass, right? Like Eric, if, if you came in and zoomed here, you, you could see that. Then if you look at the side of the door, right, you're seeing a rather substantial, and I'll crack this open for you, cut line seal, right? And so you're put, they're putting this here to help uh, smooth that slipstream as it goes across the door to help minimize wind noise. You know, Tesla, as an example, notoriously do, has poor wind noise and NVH quality, right? They, they get dinged quite often for that. And, you know, some of these things, the laminated glass, which they introduced in 2022, these cut line seals, some of the stuff that we'll talk about under hood with the HVAC. Those are a lot of things that clearly the Nissan team put together to improve the NVH package of this vehicle. And from the sounds of it, Walker, it sounds like those are working to an extent. Yeah, and at a range of speeds too, you know, trying it out on the highway and low speeds as well. Just overall, it was a pretty enjoyable cabin to be in. Sure, yeah. So size wise, right, it's, it's roughly in that same Model Y segment in space you know, fair, fairly spacious on the interior. Um, but I would say, you know, like when I opened this, this car from the first time, looking at the materials that they selected, some of the different um, aesthetic cues that they have, right? The, the LED, like the diffuser and the backlighting here, some of the Alcantara that they're applying to the seats with perforated sections as well for that ventilated function. Um, a lot of the things that they're doing on the interior, plus the overall color scheme, right? Right, this nice uh, beige interior with some of these copper, like brass toned accents, really kind of give you that more premium appeal. You know, a lot of folks don't like uh, the Tesla or some of the other OEMs out there because it's a little bit simpler, right? There's not as much, there's not as much geometry, not as much stuff going on in the interior that would kind of uh, state that the studio or the design team of that OEM really was focused on that luxury appeal. You know, so I would say my opinion, Walker, looking at this at first glance, it definitely has a, a more premium appeal yeah. than a Tesla, right? Not by a 
it's not a step change per se, but I would say incrementally nicer than what we're seeing on the Tesla. Yeah, and even from the interior perspective, um, in comparison to a Tesla, you get some of the more, I guess, quote unquote, legacy now features like stocks and some tactile buttons throughout the cabin. So there is a lot embedded into their infotainment system, but you also get some of the buttons and the stocks that you would typically be used to as well. Yeah, we should we should hop in and kind of play with some of these buttons and show that I, kn I know there's some really interesting stuff some things I like about it, some things I don't. So maybe let's hop in the car and take a look at some of those buttons specifically. Eric, if you wanna hop in the back. So right away to me, Walker, when I sat in here, I was looking at these, these stood out right away because with the vehicle off, you're not getting any of this backlighting and one thing that I'm quite impressed with with the aesthetics is all of these buttons, these capacitive touch buttons that are inlaid into this this uh, bezel right here are pretty uh, hard to identify visually unless the lights are on. So I think it was very seamless. It's very smooth, kind of gives you a very sleek appeal. But what are, what are your opinions on the buttons? Yeah, I'm kind of torn on them as well. I think aesthetically they're they're beautiful and when the vehicle's off, like you said, they kind of just disappear into this wood trim. But when you actually go to use them, it's kind of a different experience. So they are capacitive. At first I thought they were almost hard buttons, but if you touch them without just very lightly, you can see that they are capacitive. But if you press a little harder, it's almost like you get some more force feedback with it. Now, what's kind of hard to tell is if that was a feature that they chose to like add to that button or whether it's just kind of the wood itself depressing around where that switch is. So right. um, just overall, I kind of prefer more of the force feedback that I get when I press it harder, but when it's just capacitive, there's not really a lot of feedback there. Yeah, yeah, the, I would say the haptics, right? Yeah. Like, so that, that vibration that you would feel with a cell phone or anything else, it, it does give you this sensation that the wood is deflecting, right, as you're pushing the button, which frankly just kind of gives you that a, a chintzy feedback right yeah. kind of a, a lower quality feedback than you would expect and you know similarly with this timbre style door that we're seeing here all these little segments it's referred to as a timbre door where it kind of rolls up like a garage door in the back of the center console both that and these cup holder uh stabilizers or these drink stabilizers here with these little spring-loaded flaps I, i'm going to be honest they just they just feel like um pretty cheap plastic right there's nothing necessarily premium about that you were to if you were to get in like a bmw or mercedes that has a timbre door it's nicely damped yeah. you go into the cup holders and oftentimes they're over molded rubber there's a lot more of a of a premium sensation so overall looking at the interior right it's like yes soft touch um wood trim accents some sort of sleek design cues with the buttons, but then you go into more of the technical side of things and you start opening up compartments. And to me, I'm like, okay, now I'm seeing the, the air quote cheap plastic um, and some of those things that give you a less premium feel for sure. Yeah, and for almost a $60,000 car, that's some of the things you start to expect once you look start looking deeper that that, that money's being spent in these kind of things. Right. Yeah, and Walker, when you were talking about the, the quietness of the cabin here, right? Obviously, we have the windows open here, but when we had the hood open a moment ago before we had started the video, we had the the heat pump system cranking, right? The, mm -hmm. the, the AC, rather, was on full blast. So same system if you're familiar with a heat pump. Then I sat in the cabin and I rolled the windows up and it was almost imperceptible, the sounds that would typically come from the blower itself, yeah. not just the ventilation, and then the compressor, right? So they did some things under hood, which we can get to in a moment, yeah. that I would just, I would agree with you, right? Sitting in the cabin, it did, it was very, very subdued, um, pleasantly so in terms of, you know, the vehicle static position, but that HVAC noise transmitting to the cabin. Yeah, I think we can speak to the packaging when we open up the front, but overall, I guess the, the spoiler there is that the HVAC case that is typically packaged within the IP has been entirely moved to the motor bay. So. We'll talk on that later, but kind of what that does for you is first off, the, the sound that we're speaking to, it takes that blower motor and all that electronics and takes it out of the cab entirely. So we just don't hear that. Additionally though, just, I would say that this is one of the most foot room or the largest foot rooms I've had in a SUV for a while. This, the IP is very short 
and you have a ton of room down here where the HVAC case typically kind of starts extending down. For sure. Yeah, and it's something that you don't, unless you're looking for that like yeah. you are, right? It's something you don't immediately notice, but when someone says it, all of a sudden you really do appreciate yeah. it, right? And I'm uh, I'm not the most ver vertically successful person on the planet, right? So I'm about five foot six, but even so, I mean, it, it really does give you a different sense of spaciousness yeah. in the vehicle, and it's, you know, it's appreciated when you actually sit in here and feel it for yourself. Um, yeah, and se segment wise, it's it's not actually a bigger SUV than the Model Y, but I would say um, cabin size wise, you it doesn't feel like a small SUV. So I think that's some of those packaging decisions they chose to make kind of enable this this cabin to feel larger than the vehicle actually is. Yeah, and and I would say that extends to the headroom and space, right? So front is okay, it gets a little bit lower as you slant forward the rake of the windshield, but in the rear specifically, like I know. Um, Tesla, you know, VW, you know, a lot of these people um, launching BEVs in that space, that second row head package, that head form space, and that thigh angle really seems to be something that people are struggling with. That one, two couple distance from H point to H point, front seat to rear seat, meaning, right, so this hip point, that distance, that span is really what gives you a large, a, a, a major sensation of spaciousness or being cramped. And what they did is they really tried to emphasize a flat roof as far as you can go back to that second row to give you more space. And, you know, it's those it's those minor things that are on the technical side that really give that consumer like this, this sense of, oh, I've got some room in here. Right. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> there's there's two little things sort of gimmicky, but uh, sort of neat at the same time. So maybe Walker, why don't you speak a little bit to the center console, one unique sort of 4F feature that it has, and then maybe the storage in sure, the vehicle. Sure. Yeah, so uh, you can see here that there's some buttons on the side of this I, this uh, center console here that actually enable it to move forward and backwards. So kind of starts eating into the, the rear seat occupant room, but you can actually move this forward and back to kind of open up some more area up here if you'd like. And then, yeah, speaking to the storage, because surprisingly for, for how deep this center console seems to be, there's actually very limited storage here, but don't be worried because we've got some secret storage up here as well. Yeah, so this is kind of cool. It's This is, a, again, sort of a gimmicky feature, but man, you could just, in the morning, you could have like a, you could have a BLT in there oh, if yeah. that thing was heated, you know? I just, <laughs> it's like perfectly sandwich sized for sure. I don't know why that's coming to mind, but it doesn't matter. Then it you have a neat. typical glove box on this side still as well. Yeah, now now that I would say is exceptionally small, and, and I'll speak to why I think it's ex exceptionally small uh, in a moment once we go hood side, but um, yeah, I, I would agree. For a console that quite literally goes floor of body in white, like the floor of the vehicle, all the way to armrest height, there's virtually zero storage yep. in the center console. Yep. It's more of a center platform versus yep. a center console, right? Yeah, and we can see here, uh, they won't be able to see, but there's no gear tunnel in this vehicle, so it's a, a very BEV-specific platform, so flat floor, and even that being said, so this is just kind of wasted space here in the center console. It does actually make me think of the Hyundai Ionic, right? Where it had the movable center console, but in effect, the, the resultant of that was not a lot of storage, right? Cause they're packaging mechanisms and mechanicals where otherwise, you know, in a uh, all manually actuated console that doesn't move static, right? You've got a lot of bin space. Yeah. So trade-offs of course. So I don't know, with that being said, you want to go under hood and take a look? Let's do it. All right. Right, manual hood strut, complete no no frunk, right? So that one kind of hits yeah, you yeah. right off the bat. But so Walker, why don't you just help orient everyone with the major monuments under hood, see what we're seeing and what, what space, and maybe that'll lead in all why some of these things are significant. Sure, so we can start with the hardest one to see. So all the way down there would be your front drive unit. So this specific model is a front wheel drive only uh, equipped vehicle. However, there are all-wheel drive uh, variants as well. This specific one is equipped with a 178 kilowatt, uh, what the window sticker says, an AC synchronous motor. So that doesn't actually tell you a whole lot other than kind of gets you in the right family of motor that is. But digging a little deeper, this actually has kind of a unique motor that we haven't seen on the channel yet. They call it a electrically excited synchronous motor. Um, other people call it externally excited synchronous motor, but essentially what they're doing is if we were able to actually look at the internals of the motor, 
rather than having a permanent magnet or an induction rotor, they have a uh, copper embedded rotor that they turn into an electromagnet. So think like a more traditional brush, uh, like electronics motor or something smaller. They've kind of scaled that up and are actually making an electromagnet out of the rotor. And what that does is reduces a lot of the cost that is associated with magnets. Um, and it's able to get sufficient performance for what this vehicle is looking for. Um, I wouldn't say it's up there with the Teslas or some of the other more performance oriented vehicles we've looked at, but um, it didn't feel slow by any matter uh, when I was driving it. So reduces some costs. They claim they get some more efficiency out of it as well. But um, yeah, it's kind of interesting to see people taking uh, different electric motor choices based on what the, the vehicle is looking to achieve. Yeah, absolutely well stated. And if you're wondering, okay, so, so what, there's no magnets. When we're doing motor and magnet costing, right, it's not only one of the most impactful items in terms of the bill of material on a given motor from a cost perspective. It's also one of those things where we're looking at, well, what is the impact from a supply chain perspective, right? Often that's part of the discussion. We're not just looking at the absolute cost, the mass, the package, um, the technical benefit on the performance side, but also like what is the longevity, sustainability from a supply chain um, robustness perspective, right? And getting rid of those magnets, it can be very advantageous depending on where you're otherwise getting magnets from, right? Yeah. So yeah, excited to see that. Um, I hope we tear into one of these yeah. motors soon, right? Um, working our way up from there though, something kind of you noticed was that the high voltage monuments above this are actually completely separated from the motor below. So often we kind of see that stack up all mounted together, um, but there's actually some separated distance here. So this looks like probably the onboard charger and some other high voltage junction boxes here. Um, but then working our way backwards, this is kind of what we are speaking to more in the cabin. So can't really see it here, but this black case that's sitting right behind all these high voltage monuments is actually the HVAC, HVAC case itself. Yeah, so, and you're, you may be wondering why is it significant that these high voltage modules are separate from the drive unit? We'll kind of take these one by one, and then maybe why it's significant that the HVAC case is on this side of the, the cap, the dash panel. Well, from a high voltage monument perspective, from a, from a decking perspective, meaning as you're bringing all of these, when you're building the vehicle up, what we would typically refer to as the final line uh, assembly and build up, right? As, as you're deciding how you wanna do that as an OEM, in some cases, you will take all of these modules and you'll put them on what an EDM, uh, a three-in-one unit, any, any number of names for, for these modules. They'll be done at a supplier level or at a spur line, meaning a, a, a perpendicular line to the final line in the assembly plant. And they'll all be brought to the vehicle as one um, sort of homogenous unit. In this case, they're, they're mounting directly to the body, which means from a service perspective, if you have to get to that motor or drop anything from the underside of the vehicle, it's gonna be much, much simpler to do because if you're looking at all of the addresses, right? So high voltage, you know, traversing back into the HVAC case, perhaps for PTC, you're looking at low voltage going across, then going to body. You're looking at, you know, brackets, coolant lines, all of those things. If you were dropping the full assembly and these were part of that assembly, all of those connections need to be disconnected safely and successfully and then reconnected. And so it's a big advantage in the service space, but final line assembly at the OEM is typically the most expensive labor. So that also means though on the flip side that for every one of these fasteners, right, and brackets and separate pieces that they're now introducing into the system to mount these various high voltage components, those could have in theory been done either at a lower labor cost location, either a spur line driven by a supplier or a supplier proper, and those may not even need to exist in the vehicle, right? So, so there's major trade-offs in what they've done. But Walker, I know you came across an article and specifically on these brackets, there was, there was some elements related to impact. Can you speak about those? Yeah, so one of the unique things about this vehicle as a whole is kind of what we were speaking to earlier that the, the cabin feels quite large, even though the vehicle itself is really not all that big. Um, and so one of the enablers for that was moving the HVAC case inwards and maintaining a very small front overhang by actually using that black HVAC case that we're looking at as an energy absorber and an impact. So often those are not used in that manner. They're actually just kind of 
there for their own their function and that's all they're there for but bringing it inward to the motor bay they've actually leveraged that being here and are using that to absorb energy in a front impact and one of the primary things that needs to be take place for that to be enabled is that there's little windows on the back of these castings if you can see where my finger's going into and in the front impact this bolt is actually going to slip outwards so that this whole monument can kind of drop down and out of the way so that that HVAC case can be there for a front impact. Yeah, it, it's it's quite unique. So you talked about a lot of things which are, you know, topically it's like, oh, okay, impact thing, you know, great, bolt goes out of the way. Well, it's it's actually quite ingenious what they're doing in my opinion. And I would say quite exceptional in terms of what we see in the competitive landscape. An HVAC case is something that's necessary to be in a vehicle. You want, you want climate controls, you want human thermal management, so to speak, you need an HVAC case. Well, why not A, take that, which is a noise generator, and bring it closer to all of your other HVAC monuments, the heat pump system, the condenser, um, the compressor, right? Everything that makes up the thermal management controls. This is a heat pump system. So you see refrigerant lines going into that HVAC case versus a set of refrigerant and a set of ethylene glycol. So they're essentially reducing line length on all of their major thermal management components as it relates to the HVAC, right? We haven't seen it yet. They could be deploying similar strategies for other uh, thermally managed components such as high voltage modules, but using, using this space for the HVAC case, bringing everything closer, massively beneficial from a line length perspective, the amount of refrigerant, which is very costly by the way that you need to carry but then also the, the leveraging of that as a energy absorber is brilliant, right? If it needs to be in the vehicle and when you're package constrained, which of any vehicle, this is one of the most package constrained zones, typically speaking, why not use a naturally um, sort of like airy component, right? It's filled with air by, na by nature. Why not use that free crush space as we would deem it to lower that vehicle pulse index and, and kill two birds with one stone, right? That's a definitely a first for me at least, and I think probably yeah. you haven't seen it as well. No. It's kind of a Tesla approach, start integrating some of the function into existing components. And I mean, some might say, great, if I'm in a massive impact, my HVAC case is total too, but I mean, that's the least of your problems at this point. Once you're, once you're that far into your impact, there's gonna be some, some more serious things that have to be replaced. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and we have seen split HVAC cases where the blower module on a BMW 5 Series, yeah. they used to have what's called a double dash and they would pocket it just behind the shock tower between the dash panel and this double dash wall, right? It was a body and white monument. And so, we, and that's great. That's taking one noise generator out of the cabin, putting it in a isolated space, acoustically speaking, um, and, and getting it away from the cabin. But they've obviously gone, you know, the full nine yards and getting it out of the cabin. The, the other thing to me, Walker, when I'm looking at this, I know we had chatted about it, is the, the cross car member, this casting. Yeah. You know, there's, there's like little bits about the way that they executed it, this that to me speak to like a super beam approach, right? Yeah. Like, you know, the, the Tesla Model S. What are your thoughts on this beam? Yeah, definitely. And I think I would love to kind of pull off some more of it to see what else they were able to integrate into it. But the beam we're talking about here lives underneath this injection molded piece, so this guy right here, and it spans from strut tower to strut tower, so it's actually providing a lot of stiffness cross car, as well as it's cap capturing a lot of mounts and various components as it goes across. And it looks like it's probably carrying the entire HVAC case as well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when we look at the Tesla um, Super Beam, right, it was novel in that you were combining multiple functions. You're using a body structure element to support uh, a accumulator tank or a reservoir for air suspension, which also held all the heat pump components, which also held the 12 volt battery, and then the low voltage PDC, right? It did multiple, multiple functions as well as the compressor, by the way. So to me, they did a similar thing in that it carries a lot of the HVAC system, but it's like they brought one layer of the vehicle yeah. forward, quite literally. You know, so they use the, their version, I'll say, of a super beam, this cast monument, to, to carry still heat pump components, but more so on the HVAC case side versus 
the, the hoses, compressor, accumulators, and so forth. Um, and then also, right, smartly, if you're going to have this out here, they use that to support a lot of these, these high voltage modules on the, the side closest to dash there. So very, very interesting, you know, a lot of OEMs kind of went up in a tizzy when the Giga castings came out. Everyone loves to see the Tesla type approaches, but frankly speaking, looking at this vehicle between that HVAC case and the way that they've leveraged that casting, they're arguably closer to a Tesla-esque approach in terms of that cross-functional integration. And I would say just locally right here, sure. I haven't seen the rest of yeah. the vehicle, but um, then a lot of other examples that we've seen. Yeah, I would agree. I think they've taken some, some steps in that direction that uh, we haven't seen others take yet. Right, and, and also, right, hearkening back to the motor, that's a fairly bold move in the motor marketplace yeah, today. There's right. a, the only other vehicles I'm aware of that are currently doing that are the BMW iX. So we had one of those in here. Um, but besides that, it's kind of like the Renault Zoe and yep. like a Smart for Two. So you can kind of see the vehicle segment class that those motors have kind of been used in before. Yep. Um, but yeah, they're bringing it up to, to this vehicle. That's great. Well, Walker, uh, glad we brought you along, yeah. brought the brains of the operation in. What, uh, anything else that you want to cover before we close out? I guess uh, two things kind of relating to the, the same topic, but the brake regen, that was kind of the only downside I had over this vehicle specifically to some of the other electric vehicles I drove. I've grown to really like the one pedal drive where it actually comes to a full stop for you with just the right. single pedal. Um, unless I didn't configure it right, this vehicle wasn't able to do that for me. It does have, uh, what's the function in the middle that we are looking at? That button, what does it say? No step. Uh, oh, I think so. Yeah, E step. E step. So e -step. they have a, yeah. what they call an E step function, which is their, their harder, more aggressive regen. And it does slow you down, but right when you're kind of coming into that, that 10 mile an hour will you buffer zone, it, it expects you to take over for you. Yeah. And there's kind of a weird trade off where, because the brake is depressing the physical pedal during that time. And so the trade off from where you're supposed to take over for the actual stop, while well, the brake pedal is kind of slipping away from underneath you is a, interesting sensation um, one of the things i did like though about the brake regen was there's kind of a gimmicky feature you can turn on where you can see a little icon of your vehicle on the left hand side and it'll show you when your brake lights are coming on so i think most people would be like you should know when your brake lights are coming on but it's something i've kind of expressed to you yeah. recently that i was frustrated with this brake regen you don't always know when your brake lights are actually on and i kind of want to know for the people behind me if that's getting annoying or what have you so it's kind of a uh, small little feature they chose to add, but I surely appreciated it. Well, yeah, I mean, for me, if I purely accidentally am yeah. going too fast and I pass a cop, sure, sure. sometimes I want to know if my brake lights are yeah. on, you know? You just want to know. Something you want to know. So, so I thought that yeah. was interesting. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, and the one pedal driving, right, it is one of those things where it seems like minor. It's like, oh, just tune it, it's just adjustment. But it's one of those things where, in an absolute sense, the calibration and the engineering of that, that pedal is impactful. You're literally using that 100% of the time that you're driving, right? You're on the gas, you're off the gas, your foot's always on that pedal. And so the folks that have executed that well, ideally you never even know it's there. It's just like, oh, it works great. But when it doesn't work well, you always know it doesn't work yeah. well, right? It's in your face. There's, so There's definitely a level of trust there. Um, I was able to get it to come to a full stop for me if you enable the ProPilot 2.0. So they have some autonomous functionality and if you're in that, it will come to a stop for you, but you have to trust that it's going to, because if you go to touch the brake pedal at all during that time, it disengages. So you can't just got to trust it all the way that it'll come to a stop and then hope it does. Yeah, that's a hard ask until you really get comfortable with it. But yeah, I, um, I'm a fan of the one pedal driving, but I absolutely like the ability for it to just in a normal driving state for it to stop fully. Yeah, yeah. so no, good, good observations. Uh, I enjoyed walking through this yeah. with you. Hopefully you'll join us on the next video. Um, if you're interested in more, please reach out to sales at leandesign.com and hopefully we'll catch you on the next review. Thanks so much.